love, passion, and betrayal. A deadly mix that can push even the most devoted soul to the brink of madness. On the surface, they seemed like the perfect family, a successful husband, a loving wife, and children who lacked nothing. But beneath the facade of marital bliss, a storm was brewing. An affair ignited a spark that would consume everything in its path. A whirlwind of emotions, hurt, rage, jealousy, caused an act of unimaginable violence on that fateful day. Was it a crime of passion? A moment of blind fury triggered by ultimate betrayal? Or was it a cold, calculated act of premeditated murder? The heartbreaking story of the Harris family will make you ponder the complexities of human behavior. Get ready as we explore the chilling details of this startling case that gripped a whole nation. Clara Suarez was born in Bogota, Colombia, in South America on February 3, 1958. She was raised by her widowed mother after Clara's father passed away when she was only six years old. Losing her father deeply affected Clara throughout her life. Clara wanted more than anything to make her father proud, so she worked hard in school. She studied dentistry in Colombia before moving to America to advance her career. In the late 80s, she attended the University of Texas at Houston Dental Branch. During her studies, she competed and won the title of Miss Columbia Houston in a local pageant. Friends and family described her as a very beautiful woman. In 1991, while on fellowship in Houston, Texas, Clara met David Harris at Castle Dental Center, where they both worked. David, who also attended the University of Texas, graduated second in his class. David Harris, who had recently divorced, had a young daughter named Lindsay. Less than a year after their first date, they got married on Valentine's Day in 1992 at the Windmere Yacht Club in Nassau Bay, Texas, a suburb of Houston next to a Hilton Hotel. Clara encouraged David to bond with his daughter and the three of them became a family. Most sources indicated that David hadn't spent much time with Lindsay since his divorce from her mother in 1991. Clara soon formed a close bond with Lindsay. During the school year, Lindsay stayed with her mom in Ohio and she spent the summers with them. Within the next few years, both David and Clara opened their own practices. Clara practiced dentistry in Lake Jackson while David became an orthodontist. His office was located close to the Johnson Space Center, just across the street from the hotel where they got married. Clara Harris, too, opened her dental office in Friendswood, Texas in 1993. In September of 1998, Clara had twin boys, Brian and Bradley. When the twins arrived, both David's and Clara's dental practices were really starting to succeed. They bought a stunning new 9,000 square foot house in Texas, a cozy cottage by the lake, and a ski chalet in Colorado in 2001. Clara enjoyed having people over and frequently threw parties. Her family and friends thought Clara was an excellent host, making everyone feel comfortable and welcome. Clara was also very particular about details, so her parties always had beautiful decorations and her house was always very clean. The initial years after the twins' birth were tough on Clara, especially for her marriage to David. She juggled raising three children, managing her dental practice, overseeing household affairs, and adhering to their five-year financial strategy. David, feeling overlooked by his wife post-twins' arrival, started spending long hours at the office, often working late into the night. Clara accepted this as it would aid their financial plan, aiming for full ownership of their offices and total debt freedom within five years. In 2001, David hired a new secretary named Gail Bridges. Gail was married to a man named Stephen and they had three children. Before long, Gail and David became more than just employers and employees. Eventually, as it always happens, the truth was revealed. One of the women working at David's office, named Diana, took Clara out to dinner and disclosed the affair, advising her to consider any issues in her marriage. This was the first time Clara became aware of any problems. Clara confided in Lindsay, who supported her. 
On the morning of July 17, 2002, Clara confronted David about Gail, and he confessed to cheating. But he claimed that he had only kissed her hand, and he promised to do whatever it took to salvage their marriage. Clara sat down with David and created a list, comparing herself to Gail. She asked David to explain what he appreciated about Gail and why he thought Gail was better than her. David's response was heartbreaking. He told her because Gail had zero fat. The next revelation was devastating. Clara claimed that David not only confessed to having intercourse with his mistress, but described the encounters as fulfilling fantasies. He mentioned that Gail engaged in sexual activities with him three times a day. Clara decided she would double that. She also stated that she hired a personal trainer, acquired a membership at a tanning salon, and planned to have her hair and nails done daily. Clara remembered placing a deposit at the plastic surgeon's office for breast augmentation and liposuction and going shopping for seductive clothes. She retired from her job and chose to focus all her time on her family. At first, the changes Clara made appeared to be effective and David expressed his desire to leave Gail and terminate the affair. Clara requested that he call Gail and end the relationship over the phone, but he insisted on doing it face to face and Clara didn't believe it. On July 23, 2002, Clara sought assistance from the Blue Moon Detective Agency. She employed them to track David's activities and document everything particularly if he visited any hotels. Clara requested that the agency record any instances of adultery. Despite David's confession, Clara felt the need to gather evidence for legal purposes. She was assigned to an investigator called Bobby Basha. After two days, Clara made a call to Bobby Basha to check on the progress of the case. Basha returned her call, assuring her that everything was proceeding smoothly. She informed Clara that David and Gail were at the Hilton Hotel, the very place where, a decade ago, David and Clara celebrated their wedding reception, likely on the fourth or sixth floor. She also promised to provide a comprehensive report the following afternoon. However, Clara was already aware of the hotel and decided she wouldn't wait until the next afternoon to receive a full report. Clara drove her Mercedes, taking her 16-year-old stepdaughter Lindsay with her to the Hilton Hotel in Nassau Bay, Texas. Clara and Lindsay approached the front desk where the staff informed them that neither David nor Gail had checked into the hotel. Clara and Lindsay went to the Hilton parking lot where Clara discovered Gail's Lincoln Navigator. After noticing the car, Claire and Lindsay phoned David separately, informing him that one of the twins was unwell and urging him to return home. Claire and Lindsay then proceeded to the hotel lobby to await David and Gail. Shortly after, Claire noticed a pair exiting the elevator. Turned out to be David and Gail, who were holding hands. He grasped it in the same way he often held Claire's hands. Clara completely lost control. She charged at and assaulted Gail. After being pulled away from Gail, Clara managed to break free and returned to bite her. David stepped in and subdued Claire, grappling her to the floor. It seemed that David pinned Clara's head down as she resisted and attempted to reach Gail. Security at the Hilton intervened and breaked up the fight and escorted Claire out of the hotel lobby. Claire and Lindsay then went back to her Mercedes. Clara backed out of her parking space and drove quickly toward Gail's navigator. Clara hit the navigator and David, sending David flying approximately 25 to 30 feet across two grassy medians, spaced about 25 feet apart. Clara proceeded to drive over both medians and run over David again, all with Lindsay in the passenger seat. The detective from Blue Moon Agency, whom Clara hired, recorded the entire incident on video. The video became the crucial evidence in Clara's trial. At that moment, authorities weren't certain if David was alive or dead. David was declared dead at 9.48 p.m. According to his autopsy, some of David's lower teeth were knocked out. His right collarbone and six of his right ribs were fractured. As Clara drove her car over David, the car was supported only by David's ribs at one point, causing fractures in ribs 1 through 10, 
on his left side, and his left chest essentially collapsed. Medical examiners concluded that David had been run over multiple times based on the patterns and combination of his external and internal injuries, although only one set of tire tracks was found on David's body. Claire was promptly arrested and charged with first-degree murder. The murder made headlines across the country. There was a widespread debate over whether Claire should be viewed as a calculated killer or simply a betrayed wife who momentarily lost control and acted on the desire many women in similar situations may have secretly harbored towards their unfaithful husbands. On January 22, 2003, Clara Harris stood trial, accused of intentionally running over her husband with her Mercedes. Clara's defense argued that she intended to collide with Gail's car, not David. They contended that she struck David but didn't run over him. It's uncommon for defendants to testify in their own defense, but Claire did so. The prosecution also brought David's daughter, Lindsay, to the stand as a witness. Initially, Lindsay had sided with Clara upon learning about the affair. However, after witnessing her father's death and even being in the vehicle at the time, Lindsay's perspective shifted. Lindsay testified that she could sense the car running over her dad and feel the car bump each time it happened. During the court proceedings, the prosecutor asked Lindsay if Clara had said anything when she saw her dad with Gail Bridges next to the navigator. Lindsay affirmed, yes. When questioned further about what was said, Lindsay responded, I'm going to hit him. The prosecutor then inquired about the tone in which the defendant made the statement, to which Lindsay replied, like that's what's going to happen. She was extremely resolute. That's what she intended to happen. Lindsay's testimony held significant weight, particularly her statement that Claire declared, I'm going to hit him, emphasizing Claire's determination and the potential for severe injury or even death. On February 14, 2003, on her wedding anniversary, which would have marked her and David's 11th anniversary, the jury found Clara Harris guilty. Clara Harris received a 20-year prison sentence and a $10,000 fine. The jury determined that Clara acted with sudden passion and without premeditation, resulting in a reduced sentence. In Texas, intentional murder carried a penalty of five years to life whereas murder in sudden passion had a minimum sentence of two years and a maximum of 20 years. When the verdict was announced, Clara visibly broke down in tears. Clara's twin boys were merely three years old when she ran over their father, resulting in the loss of both parents simultaneously. Their father passed away, and their mother would spend the majority of her life behind bars, including a significant portion of their developmental years. The twins were under the care of Clara's friend, Anna Jones, and her spouse, and they took them to visit her in prison once a month. Clara was taken to the Mountain View Unit in Gatesville, Texas, established in 1975. The facility had a capacity of only 645 and also accommodated all of the state's female death row inmates. While she was there, her task involved converting school books into braille for the visually impaired. She applied for parole initially on April 11, 2013, but her request was denied. Another parole hearing was scheduled for September 2016, but once again, it was denied. However, in November 2017, she was finally granted parole and released on May 11, 2018. So she served approximately 15 years, but she remained on parole until February 2023. One thing is certain. There are no winners in this story, only shattered lives, broken dreams, and a brutal reminder that even the deepest love can change into something toxic if left unchecked. As we part ways, let this case serve as a cautionary tale. Love is precious, but it demands nurturing. Left to fester with rage and mistrust, it can become poisonous, with consequences too devastating to imagine. If you found this video interesting, please hit the like button, subscribe to our channel, and turn on the notification bell to stay updated on our latest true crime content. Your support helps us continue to uncover these important stories.
Share your thoughts in the comments below and remember to stay safe and take care of yourself and your loved ones. See you next time.